How's everyone today? Did we determine that the ice maker will eventually shut off? Is that just now and then to the... It's, 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 it's on the cycle? Okay. Okay. Uh, because this is going to be our new room. We are going to... We're going to meet in here. I know it might be a little chilly. Come prepared, you know, but uh, I like the fact that you can use the tables and it's a puts us a little closer here to one another. Uh, sometime in the future, there may be another a ladies group that meets. They watch a video and it's a small group that meets in that room. And that might be in August. They might start up again. So we're determined at that point. If they tell me I'm too loud, then we'll make other other jobs. I, I don't think so either, but I would just, we'll just see how that goes. Now, please don't forget, we are not meeting next Thursday because of uh, Vacation Bible School. Uh, what do we call it here? Summer blast or something? Summer explosion. Summer explosion. Um, there's going to be a lot of kids around here in every room, so uh, everything is shut down as far as extracurricular activities so no Bible study I'll still send out a reminder on Wednesday to remind you and others uh, about it I know there's a few folks that are not here today um, because they are on a on a trip or whatnot I was also thinking about teaching from back there and coming in this direction I don't know if that'd be any better or whatever uh, but I didn't get here what's that yeah, yeah, but I didn't get here early enough to, you know, to do it. So um, anyway, whatever. Uh, let's have an opening word of prayer. We'll get going. Our Father and our God, it's good to be in the house of the Lord on this beautiful, beautiful Thursday morning. Lord, it is the day that you have made. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm thankful that are all for all that are here today. And I do pray that. Uh, you bless your children, that our eyes would be open, our ears unplugged, our hearts tender to hear what you'd have to say through your word, your living word, your word that brings life, which brings strength, encouragement, conviction, discipline, healing, whatever it is you want to accomplish. Your word, when it goes forth, it always accomplishes what it sets out to do. It never returns empty. So, Father, we want to be those vessels today that when we leave this place, we will say that it was good to gather together with God's people to hear God's word because I'm a little bit more like Jesus. Father, you know our hearts. You know what birds we may be carrying. I pray you comfort and encourage your children today that we find our rest and peace in you as we'll look at today in our verses from this psalm. I pray for those who are traveling. I know that Skip and Kathleen are driving to Texas right now. I pray you be with them, give them a safe journey. Lord, others that cannot be with us today, we pray you be with them. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. I pray you'd have your way now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, 91st Psalm. We uh, started it last week. And uh, a little intro and then the first two verses. I'd like to read. Um, a number of verses right now. Let's see. I'm going to read through. Well, I'm just going to read the first two verses again. Because uh, there are some other things I want to say uh, about that. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So, so far we've seen that to dwell in the shelter of the Most High means that we are to stay close. We are to hang out. We're to um, meditate on. We're to draw close to. We're to commune intimately under the protective shield of our Father's, Father God's loving care. Um, you know, it's when, when you're, I don't know, when you're, with a, with a friend or whatever you want to draw close to them and learn from them or whatever. If you're in a, uh, I don't know, a tough situation, you see a police officer, you're going to want to stay close 
you know, to the police officer if it's kind of a, you know, tentative situation. Or your child, if your child is a little fearful, you know, in some kind of place, you're gonna see them draw close, you know, to you, because they know that's where their, that's where their protection, you know, is. And when we do so, we will rest, we'll be at peace, comforted, even in his shadow, which I think is a poetic way of speaking of the Lord of a, as a big, powerful, leafy tree that protects us from the blistering sun. You know, we, uh, yesterday, once again, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're out distributing the food, the food and it is getting hot out there. And uh, we have some men that are out in the parking lot the entire time directing people. And we put a, a, a tent up area there so they're able to rest under that. There's a couple shade trees out there that when they have a moment, they go stand in the shade to get that, you know, to get that protest, protection, to get that, that rest. But you're also gonna see that that shadow is also gonna be a metaphor of what we're gonna see in the moment about the Lord's wings. So we'll get to that in a little bit. We saw that God is our refuge. Remember what we said about a refuge? A refuge is what? A place of, of security. It's, we're safe in his hands. We read in the New Testament a couple different places that no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. It's a place of security. It also says there that he's our fortress. What's a fortress? It protects us. It protects us from attack. Now, because of these truths found in just those first two verses, then we see, as the last part of it says, that in my God whom I trust, that we can trust God. Now, I mentioned to you at the very end, and I, I wanted to say a few more things because I, I mentioned, you know, those Latin words of St. Augustine, and I don't have my uh, dry marker board because I wasn't expecting to, you know, to use it, you know, today. But hopefully, I think everyone was here, you know, last week. But I did want to say something else about that, that St. Augustine, when he, <clears throat> after his conversion, he wrote about it in the first autobiography. Many believe the first autobiog autobiography written was St. Augustine's Confessions, where he not just confessed his sins, uh, but he told his, his story in there, and it's, it's considered a masterpiece. And talked about his conversion. Well, as he thought about his conversion, as he thought about salvation, as he thought about faith, about saving faith, it got him to think about where he was at in his journey because he was a pagan raised by a very Christian mother, Monica, who constantly prayed for him. So he heard the truth. I'm sure she shared it with him often. He heard her pray probably all the time about it. So in the early days, you could say that he had that notitia faith, N-O-T-I-T-I-A, which is knowing the facts about that. So he was introduced to that concept. Somewhere along the line, and we don't know exactly in his case, but I know in my case, that we come to that point of what's called a census, A-S-S-E-N-S-U-S, -S -S, where you, your mind takes those facts and it now ascends to a place of, of truth, where you believe it to be true. And this is just logical. This is just it's true with anything you know, that we study. Again, example of Abraham Lincoln. You know the facts about him, you believe to be true. I can, you, can, you can learn all the facts about King Zeus in Greek mythology. I don't know if he's Greek or Roman, you know. But in mythology, you can know all the facts about it. You have a notitia faith about Zeus, but you don't have an ascensus faith. You don't believe him to be true. You know that that's not true. So notitia and ascensus are essentials to us coming to a deeper understanding of saving faith in the Lord, but that doesn't save you. Having that belief, I lived the first 19 years of my life with an ascensus faith in Jesus Christ. I told you I don't want to go through it all again, but I knew it up here. If you asked me, I would have told you the facts, and I would have said, and if they said to me, you know, if I was stopped by someone on the street, do you know Jesus? I'd say, well, yeah. 
If you asked me in 1973, a senior year of high school, freshman year in, in college, do you know Jesus? Number one, I, to me that'd be an odd question, but I would say, well, I, I know who Jesus is and was. I know the facts about him and yeah, I, he absolutely lived. All the time is based on on, on him and everything else. And sh sure, I, 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 I believe he did those things. I believe in those miracles. I believe that he died on the cross and rose from the dead and even died for my sins. Oh, you sound like a Christian. And I, I would have said yes. But see, I had no understanding what it meant to have a saving faith in Jesus, to have uh, a faith that I relied on him. As I joked last time, the only two times I really prayed, although I might have prayed at night, a real simple prayer, but the only real two times I prayed was when I got up to bat and when I was back, back ready to receive the kickoff, because I ran back kickoffs, believe it or not. So as I stood back there, I said, God help me. You know, is that there was the, those were the times I, I prayed. But there came a day on October 26, 1974, when I was sitting in a little Nazarene church and I heard the gospel that it moved from here to here. And how, how much distance is that? You know, a, a foot? Someone said 18 inches from here to, to here, whatever it was, where that was a divine saving faith, a spark that came from the Lord. And that's what Augustine called the fiducia faith, the trusting faith. Now, what I didn't tell you last week is to give you biblical proof of that. And what's the sense of giving you a, someone's ideas, theory, if it's not backed by the scriptures? So look with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. Starting in verse 46. Blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. I want you to think of those three words, those three stages of faith in a sense, as I read this story. Uh, Mark 10, starting in verse 46. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called him so they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you, bless you. Throwing his cloak aside, which is very significant. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, I don't know if you see Notitius Ascensus and Fiducia in there, but it all starts when he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What does that first say about Bartimaeus at that point? He knew the facts. When he heard it was Jesus, what had he heard previously that he was a miracle worker he heard those those he knew those facts for that reason he called out to him <clears throat> but he then goes on to say when Jesus asked what do you want me to do for you Jesus asked him the blind man said rabbi I want to see now what is that telling us there he knew the facts about Jesus, that this was one thing he was called, a healer. Where do we see the ascensus faith? Yes, by telling Jesus what he wanted. I want to see. In other words, I believe the stories I heard about you that you are a healer. 
Okay? <clears throat> Jesus goes and said, Jesus, your faith has healed you. Now look, here's the fiducia faith. Immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus along the road. We see that a couple of different times in the scripture when Jesus heals someone. You know, first you're sometimes saying, now don't tell anybody because I don't want to get too puffed up. I don't want, I won't get puffed up. I don't want the, the society, the town to get too puffed up, make me king, you know, right now. You know, but oftentimes we find those people who are healed following Jesus and proclaiming the victory they just received. But the fact that it says they followed Jesus along the road implies what? He knew the facts about Jesus. He believed the facts to be true, that he was a healer. And then he followed him. He now trusted Jesus. Now, again, we're not saying saving faith is a perfect sinner's prayer. We're not saying that at all. But it is interesting to see how that progressed. One other very familiar example, Luke chapter 17. And we could look at isolated verses that talk about trust and uh, just, uh, well, as I told you last week, it tells us in James that the, uh, the demons believe, you say there is one God, good. But the demons believe that and tremble. So here, demons have a notitia, and a sense his faith in Jesus Christ. More so than the average American who's not a Christian, who know some facts and believe it to be true. The, the demons were there. They, they saw it happen. But what don't the demons have? Fiducia, a saving faith, a trusting faith, which is a gift from God, as Ephesians 2 tells us. So here we see in Luke 17, very familiar, Verses starting in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was get going into the village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So again, these 10 lepers, we know nothing about them. They kept their distance on the other side of the street. They weren't allowed to be close to healthy people. We see elsewhere where Jesus literally goes up to, you know, people with, with leprosy and that they knew the facts about him. Have mercy on us, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. They believed, because it says, as they went, they were cleansed. So they knew the facts about Jesus. They believed he was a healer because Jesus said, go, present yourself. And as they did, they were healed. So they had an ascensus faith. We believe he can do this. But here's the key. If I can only find it. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him and he was a Samaritan. So here we see this fellow was praising God. What does the scripture say about who can honestly praise God? Who are the, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Who are the only ones who can truly praise God? Saved ones. No, unbelievers can praise God. Unbelievers can say things, wow. God came through on that one, you know, but that might be just a, an idiom that they, you know, they might say. But scriptures tell us that we don't want to praise the Lord. We don't want to love the Lord. There's no one righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks him. So the joke I always say is not a joke, it's reality, but Pastor Glenn could verify this himself as a youth pastor, is that I can remember in youth group having either a young lady or young man, usually it was a young lady who said, uh, you know, maybe she brought her boyfriend to youth group or something, or we knew she had a boyfriend. And of course, as the discerning, caring youth pastor as I was, I'd say, oh, is he a Christian? And you know what they'd say to me? Oh, oh, they're, they're seeking, they're seeking the Lord. And I'd have to say, well, Scripture says 
No one seeks God. No, not one. What were they seeking? Her. Yeah. Her. Now, I'm not saying that the Lord was not dealing with that person's heart and bringing them because that's exactly what the Lord did with me. Is that when Becky told her mom, this guy Randy Evans is going to give me a call, her first comment, her mom's first question was, is he a Christian? And Becky's classic comment back is, I don't know, but I'm I'm only going out with him. Go ahead, Becky. I'm only going out one time, I'm not gonna marry him. Yeah. I'm only going out with him one time, I'm not gonna marry him. Okay. But again, after that one time, she was so smitten with me, you know? No. Oh, you got the story. Well, you know, I told you before, she wrote me the letter, invited me to church. And, you know, so the Lord was drawing me. And I believe the Lord was drawing me for the past 19 years. Hadn't met, only met one person, I told you, freshman year of college, who literally said he was a born again Christian. You know, I went to the Presbyterian church and maybe there were, I'm sure there were, there were people there who truly loved Jesus. But it wasn't the type of church where the gospel was preached in such a way where we were challenged, you know, to, you know, where we were told we were sinners. And just because you're here doesn't make you a Christian, just like being in a garage is making a car, being in a McDonald's is making a hamburger. Although if you eat enough of those things, you may turn into a, you know, a hamburger. But, you know, so just being, and I always assumed everyone in church was a Christian because I'm a Christian because I'm in church and I believe those things. But it was the Lord who was drawing me, but said, today is the day of salvation. The Lord, please understand, the Lord wasn't wringing his hands for the first 19 years of my life going, oh, when's Randy going to finally get it? <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm speaking to him when he was nine, when he was 11, when he was 15, he's missing it. What's going on? What am I going to do? I hope, oh, I know I'll bring a pretty girl into his life. That'd get him. No, the Lord knew exactly what he was doing. He kept me from this. He kept me from that. He showed me this. I didn't always acknowledge it, whatever. And then on that day, he said, today's your day and spoke life into me and implanted fiducia faith into me. So we see here with this fellow, the leper, is that he came back praising God. He had a fiducia of faith given to him by God and the Lord used it in his providence for centuries to, to come to teach us where are the other nine? Were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you, you well. So I wanted you to see there, I wanted you to understand that those concepts, because I think it'd be helpful, not that you're gonna be judging your everyone you come in contact with, but it will help you, I believe, when you're dealing with your neighbor, with your friend, with a family member, and you're talking about the Lord, sometimes as soon as we hear him say, oh yeah, I know Jesus, we go, okay, great, and we move on. You know, and we have this, and again, not that we're saying, well, you have to live my kind of Christianity. No, we're not saying that. Please don't say that. There are, I used to not believe this. There are plenty of people at St. Paul's United Methodist Church that love Jesus and are saved. There are plenty of people, you know, in such, I don't want to start naming churches, that love Jesus and are, have been saved. They, um, they might have a different expression of it, but that doesn't mean because they go to that church. Now, if they're going to a Mormon church, Jehovah Witness, you know, Kingdom Hall, I'd have gray and grave concerns, you know, about that. Even within the Roman Catholic Church, who are, I think, very deceived with some of their traditions and additions, traditions and additions. I know some Roman Catholics that love Jesus and, and trust Christ. 
think you're bogged down on some other things, but you know what? We get bogged down on some things, you know? And so we're to love them, pray for them, be Jesus around them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. This morning I was listening to the Joy of them, and they were talking about this guy who's one of the biggest atheists. atheists. Even in the college, he would, you know, be a head guy in the college. He didn't believe in Jesus or anything like that. So his daughter called him. He would do anything for his daughter. So his daughter calls him and says, Father, I accepted Jesus. I'm going to get baptized. Will you please go to the rock by baptism? So one of his friends says, you have to go, even if you don't believe, you have to go. So when he went to, to the, for baptism, because he loved his daughter, he said that he felt an overwhelming joy that he never felt before. And now today, he's one of the biggest, I mean, mm -hmm. Jesus followers. Mm -hmm. Which one of the three here happened at that time when he received that joy? Well, that's very good. Well, he obviously, if he was a devout atheist, oh, then I would head say, head. I would say, forgive me for saying this, but he's like the demon. The demon who knew the facts, probably believed the facts to be true. Maybe he he said, now the historical Jesus. Listen, there's there's people, the uh, the Jesus, the Jesus. Now there's, there's a group, um, Bart, Bart, I can't remember his name now. There was a group some years ago of scholars that got together, religious scholars, and they determined that in the New Testament, one or two things are true. Somehow they said, no, that, that's not true, that's not true. The Jesus something, you know. So these are people, there's professors that teach religion, teach Christianity, that know it inside and out, that, that aren't Christians. So what I'm saying is that is we don't know where he was at. He knew the facts, whether he believed the facts to be true. That day, the Lord did it all. He heard the preacher talk about the people being baptized and the gospel was presented. That's the bottom line. Somewhere in there, that pastor or someone said, and Betty Lou, who's professing her faith today, at one time was an unbeliever, but Jesus Christ revealed himself to her. And she saw that Jesus Christ truly was not only a human, but divine. And that he died for her sins and rose from the dead and sent his Holy Spirit and spoke life into her. And she's publicly professing that. Well, there's the gospel. So he heard it all. And God in his benevolent providence said, boom, today is today that I'm bringing life, you know, into you. And that's the beauty of God's power and his, you know, and his grace. Isn't that beautiful? You reminded me of, of something else. I completely forgot it now. So I'll see if it comes back to me later of another example or, or something else that came to me. But it, well, I had to read a book in college called The Historical Jesus, which... Yes, Bart. Is that his last name yeah, or first name? Uh, uh, first name. Bart. Bart. Uh, Erd, Erdman. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, Bart Ingram. Yep, that's it. Charter. That's it. And he, I believe he's part of that Jesus, whatever, you know, that, that was. Okay. So I wanted you to understand that trusting part because as we see in this 91st Psalm, when he says... He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's where true peace comes from, from trusting God. Now, you're, you're, you're saved by faith, his saving faith of him speaking life into you, but that's not the end of the road. I mean, we, you know, that fellow, you know, had a conversion experience. God spoke life into him, and now he had to get out of the boat and start walking in it. He had to start following now, I'm not saying he wouldn't be a Christian if he, he didn't. In God's providence, he'd deal you know, with them. But the last thing we want is someone to raise their hand in a church service and, and say some words following the, the pastor and then walking out of here. And, and see, that's the danger. That's the danger of some of our evangelism is that we do a, a mass setting like that. And we see, you know, did you know, I forget the percentage, but it's a... Horrible percentage. Billy, the Billy Graham Association 
How many of you ever heard Billy Graham in person? Yeah, I heard him over in Tampa many, many, many years ago. Maybe you were there as well. He himself in his association said that a phenomenal number, I'm gonna say 50%, but I think the number's even higher of people who came forward gave a phony address when they were filling out the response card. Now, maybe because they truly were converted but didn't know what they were buying, you know, whatever, maybe they just gave a wrong address, you know, whatever it was, but for the numbers to be that high, it can't be just misprints. Is that, now, I'm not taken away from the amazing work that Billy Graham did. God saves, not Billy Graham. And he'd be the first one to, to say it. But the point is, is that sometimes people respond to an emotional plea or because their friend says, <laughs> we can remember in the, in the Nazarene church, Becky would tell stories when she was little of some of the older saints during the altar call would literally be the Holy Spirit and go over and grab a teenager and say, you're coming with me <laughs> and take them to the altar. And that kid's, that kid's wailing and crying the whole time. You think, wow, this is really a conversion. Look at him, look at him, he's really repenting. And he's saying, no, please, no, make me do this, you know, whatever. That's not our job, it's the Holy Spirit's job. So. It's a, a God is who, who he, can be, he can be counted on. Now, let's move on. Verse three, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. Look with me, if you could, real quick to Psalm 124. If not, I'll read it to you. 124 verses six and eight say this. This is a song, Psalm of David. It's a psalm of ascent. What does that mean? What did I say that psalms of ascent were? They would recite them as they ascended to the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was on a hill. So it's a song of ascent, a pilgrim psalm, also called. All right, verse six. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. And then a couple books over, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 12. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare. So people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Now, I'm looking now at the gentleman sitting in the back table because they've been at Countryside for years. Annie, you've been here for a long time. Do you, and Becky, do you, any of you remember the song we used to sing about the Fowler's Snare? about being released from the Fowler's snare. Oh, I was hoping someone, someone did. I cannot remember how it went at all. But it was one of John Lloyd's songs, I don't mean he wrote it, but him strumming a guitar about us being released from the Fowler's snare. Doesn't that sound familiar to any of you? Yes. Yeah, I can't think of it either. So oh, Becky's, Saturday, yeah, Becky, Becky's going to uh, Google that, you know, for us. But when I read that verse, I said, oh my, this is where that, you know, that comes from. Now, what is a fowler's snare? Old term. What's a fowler? A, it's one who catches, kills, hunts fowl, which would be chickens, turkeys, quail. What else is considered fowl? There's plenty of food that I think is fowl, but I don't mean that. Meatloaf, you know, that's fowl. Duck, duck would be foul, you know. And so it's talking about surely he would save us from the fowler's snail. So here, snare. So here we're going to see about how God brings protection and comfort and care, you know, to us. Surely he shall. Now, first it says, I'll tell you about fowler's snare in a second. But first it says he will save you. Now, this is important to remember about the Old Testament and that word save Savior, salvation. 
When we see that word in the New Testament, what is it speaking of 99% of the time? No, in the New Testament. Oh, the New Testament. Um, salvation. salvation. It, it, it means that you've been saved from your sins. You, you were dead in your sins and the Lord brought life to you. You've been forgiven of your sins. But the mistake we make is think that because we read that in the New Testament, that's what it means in the Old Testament. Now, at times it does. But what does saved mean most of the time in the Old Testament? And I kind of already said it. And it's set free, yeah, set free, rescued, delivered. So when the Israelites are crying out, save us, O Lord. Were they saying, Lord, we're sinners and we're going to die in our sin. We need to be saved from our sin. No. Rescue us from our enemies. Deliver us from this pestilence. Rescue us from these enemies that are chasing after us. Find anything, Becky? Still okay, still looking. All right. Let us know when you find your, your answer here. So when it tells us that we're saved from the fowler snare, this, they didn't have guns back then. So how did you catch a trap, an arrow, or a trap? Most likely a trap. And they'd use different kinds of traps. And they put things, your hair barrette, someone's hair barrette just fell this one, is that they put different things in the net to attract them. Whether it be a decoy, quack, quack, and have a decoy there, or some kind of, yeah, that was my chicken son, you know, or some kind of, yeah. no. it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, or the, the, the quote Chico Marx in one of the Marx Brothers movie where Groucho said, we got to drive over the viaduct. Viaduct, viaduct, why not a chicken? <laughs> uh, you can think about that all day. All right. I'm a, Mar I'm a Marx Brothers fan. So it says here, her deliver, save you from the snare of the fowler. So a fowler is one who would be secretly hiding, setting a trap, to deceive the bird so the bird will be caught. Now, what does that represent? What do you think the writer of the psalm is saying there? What is he referring to? The devil, demons, or any enemy that's going to set a trap you know, for us. In our world today, there are millions of traps set for us. Every time you go on the internet, there's a trap there set for you. There are what they call clickbait. I hate it when you see an article that says, you know, uh, top 50 such and such, and it shows you a picture of, a, of an actor or whatever. Yes. And you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the article, nothing else, I'm interested in that article. But I wanna see what it says about Arnold Schwarzenegger, right. because he's in the picture. He's on the picture. So you click on it and see that next person. You gotta scroll down all the ads, click on next, click on next. Oh good, I'm not the only one that does this. And you never get to the picture about Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's what they call clickbait, to get you to click, it baits you. So there's plenty of temptations out there that are there to snare us, that look attractive. Listen, if sin wasn't attractive, if sin wasn't pleasant in that sense, then it wouldn't be a problem. But it's because sin is made to look attractive, because it's made to look to be productive, whatever it is, that's how we get sucked you know, into it. Unless we stay close to the Lord under the shadow of his wings. Even the closest, though, even those who are walking devoutly with the Lord may fall and stumble. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. This, remember, this psalm and the Proverbs and, and many other things in Scripture are not necessarily absolute promises. When we read through this psalm, you will get the impression that nothing will ever befall the Christian when you read this. But we know that that can't be the case. 
We know that the Lord's grace and love will get us through that. But here's one of the clinchers for me is it says he will save you from the fowler's snare. What does that already imply? Say it again. Yeah, you're already in the snare. So he's going to save you, rescue, deliver you from it. We're all going to fall short in different ways. But as we trust the Lord, what has he promised to do? To rescue us out of that snare. Now, there are Christians today, somewhere in China, somewhere in North Vietnam, somewhere in Sudan, who are sitting alone in a deep hole that has been dug, that they've been thrown into. And, you know, they get maybe thrown a, a piece of who knows what to, to eat or whatever. And they're crying out to the Lord to be saved. And they may be rescued. They may not be rescued. They may die in that hole and be ushered into heaven as a martyr, you know, for the faith. Now, I do remember a song that we used to sing, because I remember Pastor Lloyd talking about this, is that a missionary wrote this song that, I don't know if it was this missionary or another missionary who was in, in prison in that kind of setting. And so he's down in a hole and there's a, a cover over him, whatever, he could barely see the light. And while he was down there, he would sing praises to the Lord. And I'm trying to think if he sang, um, I will sing unto the Lord for he has. No, it was this one. Um, Lord made a way. Through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Yep. Strength for today is mine all the way. All that I need for tomorrow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I got to do is follow. Okay. All right. Now, this missionary was, or this Christian would sing it and sing it and sing it. And eventually his captors couldn't take it any longer. They couldn't take his attitude about it. And so, hi, yes. So they, hey, is your son KJ? Yes. He's a wonderful young man. Oh, thank you. We love having him with thank us. You. Thank you. He's a wonderful servant over helping he hands. Oh, there you go. Good for you. Good for you. So, yeah. And he, he finally, they finally just let him go. Can't put up with this any longer. Yeah, get out. Vamoose. Vamoose. You know, whatever. Okay, so it says here that he's going to save us, deliver us from the snare of the, the fowler. And of course, again, as I said, this is the person who is, uh, you know, trying to catch birds. I have a quote here from Psalm 140. You don't have to turn to it. Psalm 140, verses 1 through 5. Rescue me, Lord, from evildoers. Protect me from the violent who devise evil plans in their hearts and stir up war every day. They make their tongues as sharp as serpents. The poison of vipers is on their lips. That's found also in Romans chapter 3. Keep me safe, Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the violent who devise ways to trip my feet. The arrogant have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net and have set, set traps for me along my path. So the writer is clearly saying that, Lord, folks, in this world, we're going to face, there's an enemy, whether the enemy be the devil, his demons, or the world, because the world doesn't want you to succeed. The, the, the world cheers when another Christian falls. Unfortunately, sometimes the church cheers when another Christian falls, which is very sad because he's, you know, because he's Pentecostal, because he's such and such. See, I knew that stuff wouldn't work. You know, he's not following Jesus like I am. And another one bites the dust. Instead, that should break our hearts. You know, break our hearts and cause us to pray all the more and to pray for others and to be an example to them and to examine our, our own heart. You know, and say, there by the grace of God go I. You know, that, uh, but the world is not cheering for you. 
you know, I, I know friends of yours, family or whatever, that they don't hate you because you're a Christian. Sometimes they, they may. Scripture says they, you know, they may. My family's proud of me as a pastor or what, whatever, you know, but the world is looking for you to slip up just so they can say to the, so it will justify their own, okay, see, it's, it's, it's not worth it. I don't need to, you know, to do that, you know, whatever, you know, et cetera. Um, the, 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 the Fowler is going to do everything they can to compromise our loyalty. We read in the 119th Psalm, the 110th verse, the wicked have snet, set a snare for me. They have not, but I have not strayed from your precepts. And I'm keeping my eyes on, on the Lord. I love this quote from Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon. We are foolish and weak as poor little birds and are very apt to be lured to our destruction by cunning foes. But if we dwell near to God, he will see to it that the most skilled deceiver shall not entrap us. So that's why we need to be on our guard. We don't need to be paranoid about everything and everyone, but we need to be on our, our God, guard. We need to teach our children. It's so sad that we live in a society now, you know, that um, I just saw being pushed by. The little kids are pushed in a, a, a red, you know, carriage. They go out, just get some fresh air. And so when we're out there with helping hands, every, anytime the kids come by or I'm in the hallway walking to get something and the kids are coming by, I always say hi to the kids and wave to them, whatever. But I can't help but think that the teachers who might not know me have been so trained to be protective of the kids is that stranger danger, he's saying hi to us. You know, I, I can't imagine the teachers going to, now little kids, we don't know who that man was. He's walking through the halls and he's jingling keys. So he, he must know what's going on around here, but we don't know who he is. You know, you can get paranoid about that. I, I knew one mother that when their son, they're in a restaurant, their son who might've been eight or nine was gonna go to the restroom on this truth. And when he said, I gotta go to the bathroom. He goes, okay, the bathroom's right over there. And as he was getting up, the mother said to him, don't let anyone touch you in there. I mean, what are you telling this kid? Be afraid. You're freaking this kid out here, living in, in fear. I get it. There's danger out there. We have to be vigilant, but we don't have to hide in a closet and say, I'm not gonna talk to wave to, you know, anybody, you know, out there. So anyway, remember the Fowler works in secret. He changes his trap and his methods. He often entices with pleasure or profit and he'll use a, a sometimes a decoy to distract us, you know? And so that's what he's telling us here in this 91st one. He says, surely he will save you from the Fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. Now, yes, Back in those days, there were pestilence, there were locust attacks, there were other things such as that. Some versions may include, you know, a disease in there as well. This does not mean that Christians will not get COVID, will not get an infectious disease. There were, there were some who were preaching, you know, we're not closing down, we're not wearing masks, we're not doing anything you know, here, because we're Christians and God's going to protect us. You know, there's a, a time and a place to be careful. Now, don't get me going on it. I think we were pretty, a little too paranoid, you know, in our, our country about those sort of things. Absolutely. But Christians get sick. Christians get infectious diseases. I have a Christian brother. When I say Christian brother, let me be my brother, but I mean a Christian brother who, I forget how old he was, but we knew from Trace Diaz and might have been 50 years old. And he had a couple other pre-existing, relatively healthy, but he might have been diabetic or whatever. And early on, he got COVID and died in a week. And, when, and this guy loved Jesus. It's like, whoa, that verse apparently doesn't apply to him. You know, no, this is going to you know, happen to us. It can, it can happen. You know, but it does mean that those who trust God I believe are more often than not delivered from such dangers. We, you know, how, how, who here cannot testify 
of God delivering us from something, from some illness, some accident, some tragedy, whatever it is. I read this story here uh, from the 15th century. Lord William Craven was a Christian in England, a nobleman. He was living in London when the plague ravaged the city again in the 15th century. And in order to escape the uh, spreading pestilence, he was going to do what many people of wealth would do. What would they do? What's that? Leave town. Go to their country estate far away from, from everyone else. So in order to escape the spreading pestilence, Craven determined to leave the city for his country home, as many of his social standing did. He ordered his coach and baggage made ready. But as he was walking down one of the halls of his home, about to enter his carriage, he overheard one of his servants say to another, I suppose by my Lord's quitting London to avoid the plague that his God lives in the country and not in the city. It was straightforward and apparently innocent remark, but it struck Lord Craven so deeply that he canceled his journey, saying, my God lives everywhere and can preserve me in the city as well as in the country. I will stay where I am. And he stayed in London and he helped the plague victims and he did not catch the disease himself. Now he could have caught the disease and glorified the, you know, the Lord through it, but he decided he was going to stay there and, and face that. So again, children of God are not always immune from physical plague and pestilence, but they're never guarded from, but we are ever guarded from destructive spiritual forces that may dwell, uh, you know, in, in our, our, around us. So yes, what we have here is another example of the Lord saying, you stay close to me, I'm gonna take care of you. And even if you do get sick, you know, I know people, you know people who've been very sick, near death, dying, and are shining examples of God's grace and mercy. We have a, a woman that we have at, at our, our church who uh, has had battle with cancer for years. How old is Lana? 70, 70 you know, maybe. But she's battled it for a number of, of years. Last, before last Thanksgiving, they were positive she was going to pass away. That she was, you know, and so preparations were made. Her family, brothers and sisters, all Christians came down to be with her. Her daughter, who's out in Nebraska, came to stay with her. We went to see her. I was there to see her praying with her. She wants me to participate in the memorial service. So she's talking all about that, whatever. I mean, we did not think she'd make it to Thanksgiving. She made it to Thanksgiving. So then we thought, well, maybe she's holding on to Christmas. She made it to Christmas. And I'm not talking laying on a deathbed unresponsive. I mean, she's very, very weak. She drinks broth most of the time, sits on the back porch down in the, in the Indian Rocks area and overlooks the, you know, the water there and one of the, you know, inlets there. Um, I'm hoping to go back and see her real, you know, real soon. But she made it through Christmas. She made it through New Year. She made it through her birthday. She made it through her husband's birthday. She's still alive today. And I'm telling you this, because she is still a shining example of God's grace, sharing with anyone she can. Still occasionally, Becky says, gets on Facebook, makes a comment about something, and the Lord is preserving her for his good purposes, but she knows that there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, and that her body is deteriorating. But even as it says in Job, even though even though worms may devour my flesh, yet I will still see my Lord. Something I can't remember exactly the, the quote, but no matter what's happening to me, I'm still gonna see my Lord and praise my Lord, you know, during that. So that's the example there for us. All right, let's move on. Uh, the next verse, I love this. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart or the, the other word that for rampart there, I have written somewhere in my notes. Well, we'll get to that part in a second. But I wanna to talk to you about this covered by his feathers. 
In a metaphor, God is represented as a bird sheltering young chicks under his wings. What's that? Yeah, buckler. Yeah, yeah we'll I, get. I, I, I know it by heart, but in the King James. Okay, we'll get to buckler buckle. of what buckler is. Thank you for <laughs> you know for that. Uh, David said previously in Psalm sixty one four, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Now, before I say more about that, I want to take a little side road here that I think you'll find interesting. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Daniel. So it's a little ways past where we're at. It's past Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 5. I'm going to read to you the first six verses. This is when he's with King Belshazzar. Or Shazar. What's that? Belshazzar. Yes, Belshazzar. King Belshazzar gave, this is verse 1, a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar, did I say it right again? Belshazzar was drinking his wine. He gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple of Jerusalem so that the kings and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. In other words, mocking the Lord. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. And then they brought in, you know, what, what does it say, whatever. And it's basically, it says, Mini, Mini, Telkel, Carson, which means God has numbered the days of your reign, brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Well, here's where I want to go with that. Is that the Mormons, we talked about the Mormons last week, but the Mormons use these verses to prove that, what did I tell you that the Mormons said about our God? That he was once what? A man, a man like us on another world. The Mormons teach that God, our God, they used the King James Version with their other texts, that our God was at one time a man, a human, living on another planet, and he went through the same things in a different way that we went through, and he was elevated to Godship, whatever. And the proof they use is they say, see, it says right there that God with a human hand wrote on the wall. So that's what they say. See, he's got a body just like us. Although the scripture tells us numerous times, the Lord is spirit and should be worshiped in spirit and truth. So here they use this text. Well, if you're going to take that verse in Daniel and say that God is human because he had a human hand that he was writing with, then you have to take these verses in Psalm 91 to say that our God is a great big chicken or some kind of bird because he has wings and he hides us under, you know, his, his feathers. Now, I know I'm being facetious, you know, with that, but the point is still the same. You can't take something out of context and say, see, why did God use a human hand to write on the wall? To get, number one, to get their attention. And who was going to destroy him as king in his kingdom? Humans, his enemies. So here's a human hand saying, see, I don't need to do anything. I have in my sovereignty full control of what's going on here and you're gonna be destroyed. And I'm showing you right now, I'm spelling it out for you. And of course you realize this is where we get the expression, expression the writings on the wall comes from you know from this and I'll throw this one in for free you ever hear the expression by the skin of your teeth 
That's from the book of Job. There's a lot of things that we say in our everyday vernacular that comes from the comes from the scripture here. So we also, see him. There's no body attached. Right. There's just that hand. Yes. So. Yes. So it's a thing like the Adams family. You know, or whatever. So again, going back to the to the bird metaphor here, um, Luther said, it is faith which makes you the little quit. It is faith which makes you the little chicken and Christ the hen, that you may hide and hope and hover and cover under his wings, for there is health in his wings. Look with me now to Matthew 23. I want to show you something that I, I see a connection here. Matthew 23, verse 37, I believe. Jesus is looking over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is uh, Matthew 23, 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. So we see here that the Lord's crying over Jerusalem, saying to them that he would have saved and sheltered Jerusalem and its inhabitants, but the people in their sin were not willing. They would not come to him. They would not dwell in the shelter of the Most High. They cried out for his crucifixion instead. So here we see that as we draw close to the Lord and run to him for protection. I heard this said once. Um, I don't think I've mentioned it in this class here. But uh, when, when our kids are little, especially today, what do we teach our kids to do if there's, if there's danger? If they're walking through the neighborhood and they see danger they see someone coming towards them that's menacing or whatever okay we tell them to to run and then what do we tell them to do run where to run home or to run to you ever notice police stations fire stations certain places and, and a lot of kids don't know this but there's a sign outside the the door can't remember what the symbol looks like but it's red and I think it says safe place and I forget what the symbol is but we need to teach our children that that that's a safe place that you can run if you're in danger now I'm all for teaching our kids that but what is really the first thing we should teach our children to do the first split second they see danger yeah Jesus help me Jesus save me then run but we, we need to have that mindset that we need to dwell in the presence of the Lord. We need to seek shelter with him. That doesn't mean you don't run to the police station or to someone's house that you know that's a safe, safe person or whatever. That doesn't mean you don't, you know, just stand there. Jesus save me. Jesus help me. As this guy's running towards me with a knife. I'm just going to stand here with my hands in my pocket because I'm calling on Jesus. Jesus saved me. No, you better find a big stick that you can bop them with as well as you're running, calling on the name of Jesus. So anyway, I'm just throwing that in there for, you know, for free. All right, now we get to the next part where it says, His truth shall be a shield and rampart. Rampart. Oh my goodness, it's too late. We need to put a clock up there. Yeah. All right. Someone said something when I started that, and it just made me look at my watch. So I don't know if you groaned or whatever and said, oh, he's got more. No. <laughs> All right. We'll get to that one uh, next time. We'll talk about what rampart or buckler, you know, means. And uh, we'll move further on into it. Okay? Any questions, comments? Never found the song. Okay. Ask Joan. We'll ask Pastor Glenn, because Pastor Glenn was there in the living room. See if he knows. But I, there is a song about the Fowler's snare that we were released from. All right. Father, we thank you that you have delivered, rescued, saved us from the Fowler's snare. The first snare is us being born in sin. 
and you rescued us from that, Father. Thank you for your grace, your saving faith that brought life into us and released us from that darkness, Lord. Lord, we're grateful that you are with us no matter what pestilence that we face, no matter what trial we face, Lord, you will be with us. You will guide us through it, Father. Lord, help us not to be presumptuous. Help us not to be cocky about these things and not be wise. You told us to be wise as serpents, Lord. So help us, Father, to use true wisdom that comes from you. But help us, Lord, also to cling to you, to stay in your shadow, Father. For that's where there's peace. That's where there's safety. Lord, be with us now as we go our separate ways, that you would continue to use us to reflect your love and mercy to those we come in contact with. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you. Remember, we're not getting together next week. No Bible study. You're allowed to study your Bible next week, but we won't be doing it collectively here in this setting. All right? Thank you. Bye-bye.